key team from the imitation game. Firstly, I'd like to welcome the writer of the film, Graham Moore. <laughs> welcome. Um, secondly, playing Alan Turing in the imitation game, Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, playing Joan Clark in the imitation game, Kira Knightley. And the director of the imitation game, Morton Tildum. <laughs> Welcome, all of you. Thank you for being here. And, um, Thank you. We've got about 30 minutes, I've just explained to everyone, I'm going to open things up with a question for each of you and then we'll open up to the audience and get, hopefully get through as many questions as we can. Congratulations all four of you on a truly fine film, um, which is opening the London Film Festival tonight. Um, firstly, a question, question for you, Benedict. Um, presumably a role like this playing Alan Turing comes with a strong sense of responsibility, not just to do a, a good job as ever, but when you're, when you're telling the life or some of the life of someone who's been wrong to put it lightly, lightly by history. I mean, mm. there's, there's an extra weight there, I'm sure. I think so, and the, the sort of disparity between uh, his importance and prevalence in our modern culture, as well as what he achieved in the 20th century and the comparative lack of knowledge of the full span of his story in life. Um, I mean, there's a fantastic film, which I, a film of the play, Breaking the Code, which I saw, and I think I was taught some variation of what went on at uh, Bletchley Park, and his name was mentioned, but... Um, the idea of getting a broader story out there, and a broader picture of him to a broader audience was, is obviously something um, that does bear a certain weight of, of, of importance. And uh, yeah, it's, it's his legacy. You know, this has been uh, an extraordinary decade for him because of pardons, because of his centenary, because of exhibitions and books and, and, and now this film. So it's part of a momentum, I hope, to, to have him at the forefront of... Um, uh, the recognition he deserves as a scientist, as a computer, uh, a father of the modern computer age and a war hero and a man who lived an uncompromising life in a time of um, dis disgusting discrimination, contextualised obviously by the th fear of you know, the red threat but still without, without um, that's not an excuse for what happened to him. And, and to also try and, on a sort of more personal note, examine something that's not very well documented. I mean, he physically, there's no uh, medium of him. There's no, um, ironically, considering what he was about, uh, there's no, maybe not, maybe not because of the secrecy, but he was, you know, there's no oral recording, there's no visual or audio recording of him. So there's a huge weight. Yes, it's a blank canvas to an extent, so you have a bit of freedom, but um, it's... Uh, yeah, you, you're, you're, you're toying with something you, you have nothing to, to bounce off with as a reflection. Um, so I just, I worked out from Graham's brilliant script and Morton and I, I especially Morton's research and what he told, guided me towards and, and the people I was lucky enough to meet who either met him or, or, or related to him. And however long ago it was in their life story, they, they gave me accounts that were helpful to personalise this extraordinary man whose achievements we know in a sort of broad headline term, but be more specific about who he was moment to moment in our story. Graham, I know that um, Alan Turing for you was a, has been a personal hero for a long, long time. I've heard you say that you were your self-confessed self -confessed science nut as a teenager. Um, so you, I mean, you obviously had a strong idea that this, this was a story that needed to be told. That doesn't necessarily translate to the film business, assuming, you know, agreeing that this is a story that should be told you know, for a broad audience, as Benedict says. Was there a mountain to climb there at all? Persuading people it should be made? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've been obsessed with the story of Alan Turing since I was a teenager, and I was lucky enough as a teenager to get to know this story and to get to sort of be aware of the story of this tremendous person who uh, accomplished all these things that no one knew about. And I'd always, you know, as a fan of films, I'd always wanted to see, um, I'd always wanted to see an Alan Turing movie. I'd always wanted to see his story told. As Benedict said, it had been told so well on the page and on the stage before, but no one had ever done sort of a proper cinematic treatment of it. And it was always sort of insane to me, like, how come no one has made, made a film about Turing? He's such a sort of amazing, fascinating character. Um, and, and as an audience member, I, I craved it. I think I, just to get this movie made, I would, have been a, I would have been a PA on the set of The Imitation Game if I wasn't the writer, and I'm so glad that I got to have that job. Um, uh, you know, uh, it was such a, it, it's, a, it's an honor to get to have been a part of bringing you know, a story to, to a much broader audience. 
Kira, but Benedict was saying that <coughs> Alan Turing, despite his fame, there was you know, very little documentation, little or no recordings of him. Joan Clark is obviously less well known, but were there were there sources you can draw you were able to draw on beyond Graham's script? Um, there was uh, there, there's an interview that she gave, which mm. Morton told me about, which is online. Um, which I mean, she she was probably what in her mid seventies, yeah, late seventies, like you know. Um, so so yes, I watched that. Um, and certainly took, I think, that, core, that quality of sort of that quiet, sort of very, um, very nice, very sort of feminine sort of <coughs> type person. I thought that was really interesting. I like the idea that, you know, she was absolutely somebody who was sort of breaking boundaries in her own right, but she didn't go about it like a bull in a china shop. You know, she, you sort of didn't see her coming. And I, I got that from, from the interviews that she gave and also the sort of the great friendship and love that, that existed between her and Alan, you could really feel that in the interview that I saw, you know, there was still, she was so protective of him, even talking about him. But, but I mean, relatively speaking, there's very little. Given, given how important she was, um, there's very little to go on with her. M Morton, I'm sure you share everyone's feeling that this is a story that needs to be told, but in, in film terms, for you, why did you, why did you want to do it? What, what grabbed you about, about making it? I mean, when I, when I read the script, I was shocked how little I knew about it before. Uh, it, it's... Uh, you know, why, why wasn't he on the front cover of the history book when I was at school? Uh, and maybe, I mean, I, was, I just moved to Hollywood. I was an outsider in Hollywood. And to me, this is a movie about outsiders, uh, about those who are, you know, different, who think outside the norm. And, and there was something uh, about that story that really struck me. And uh, uh, I was reading a lot of scripts, which were action thrillers and superhero movies and all that, and then come this period British movie, and I just became obsessed with it. It's uh, such a, it felt such an important and beautiful story, and uh, he as in, had such an unsung hero who achieved so much. Uh, and uh, it's also this great human element of this, 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 this man who didn't fit in who was you know, ahead of his time, outside of his time, and was carrying all his secrets, his layers and layers of secrets, how you know, his sexuality, how he was, you know, as a mathematician, was, became almost this like, spy, super spy, in, 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 involved with MI6, with all the secrets in it. And it's, it's both on a character level and on a story level, it, it, it's, uh, it became something I just needed to do, and it's and I feel very privileged and honored to to try and spread, you know, the legacy and the word of Alan Turing. Thank you. Thank you, um, Espinos, Norwegian Broadcasting. Uh, to Porten Tilde, I don't know if I can ask you to annoy someone by answering partly in Norwegian. I'll let you decide that. How is it? Can you share your feelings on this day, opening the film festival with such a film? Uh, it's, it's really, actually, it's, it's a little bit like coming home for the movie, uh, in a weird way. I mean, I mean it's, it was shot here in London. Uh, it was very important for us to, to, to shoot it here and to shoot it as as many locations as possible where the movie, things happen with each other, that let's leave each other, that the school where Alan Turing went to, Shoreborne. And in many ways, it is obviously like Norwegian coming in here, and I came up with a lot of respect for the culture and for the story, which would tell me this is an important part of British history, and I wanted to get it right. And it's a, I can't wait for tonight. It's a great honor, and it's a, uh, and it's very thrilling to come here and show the film to the British audience. So, uh, so it's gonna be a great night. Can you do a bit of that in Norwegian that I can translate for everybody? <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> can you do a bit of that in Norwegian that I'll translate for everybody? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's and it's and I I actually have to say I've been so well received. I mean, it's I was thinking like, okay, so I got this phenomenal top British talent, and everybody said yes to be a part of this. And here comes this Norwegian, and it's going to you know tell this this important story. And it and I I would say I've, it, it's been the whole thing has been just such a pleasurable experience, and it's been so well received here. So so it's, uh, uh, I'm very thankful. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Eva Přivželová from uh, yeah, Czech Republic. I have a question for Mr. Cumberbatch. Since the movie opened, uh, there's the Oscar uh, talking about it for you that you will uh, get the Oscar nomination. So does it bother you or how do you perceive this Oscar game? Um, uh, <laughs> well, you know, if it gets people to see the film, 
Frankly, this is really is all I care about. And it's very early on. It's very flattering, of course, but um, there are a lot of other extraordinary films and performances that people haven't seen yet or are also talking about. So um, it's a far way off. But if it creates an interest to, for people to see this film and what the fuss is about, then that's fantastic because it means our jobs as storytellers is made easier if, if there's an audience for our storytelling. And more importantly for me, um, having sort of had some experience with this extraordinary man, I really want his story to be known as broadly as possible. And our film to be a launching point for more interest and understanding of him and a proper celebration of him, of Alan Turing. So um, from that point of view, it's good. Thank you. There was a question, a couple of... Frank Johnson, Bergen Newspaper, Norway. Just a follow-up to the other Norwegian guy's <laughs> question. Just to, just to the actor, to, to the actor. Uh, <laughs> because this is a very British story told by a Norwegian director, uh, did it surprise you while shooting or before shooting? Or was it something he fresh you brought to the script or to the film? Talking to Benedict and Kira. Oh, sorry. Kira. Oh, the, about him being Norwegian? Yeah, yeah no, no. About... Uh, <laughs> Did, did he surprise you during the his Norwegian the process? <laughs> no, no. Um, his sensibility to the his sensibilities. No, I, I thought it was a very, very cool, very intelligent, very smart fit to to bring a man who um, had brought an incredibly uh, entertaining but really dark thriller to all of our attention last year or the year before. Was it two years ago. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But you know, he he proved him his brilliance with that, and the idea of combining that talent on something that had a massive thriller component, but also the minute I met him, I realized how astute he was, as, as is actually borne out with, with, his, with Headhunters, with character study. It is all about character study. You, you, you aren't invested in a thriller unless you care about the characters. So um, I was thrilled, and we talked, and we got on really, really well. We both shared a passion for the subject, having engaged with the script and, and discovered more about this man than, um, than we had before, and being ashamed of that. Like, I, I was the, the same as Mawson. Why isn't this man on... On, on, on some denomination of our currency. Why isn't he on the front cover of science textbooks, history textbooks? So um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I was thrilled. And, and day by day, you know, he's got an extraordinary energy. And uh, <laughs> even when he's, caffeine. a lot of, yeah, caffeine, a lot of and caffeine. And even when he's over caffeinated and, you know, I, I, some of my stutter was often modeled on Morton. <laughs> um, um, we had a wonderful, uh, um, a script supervisor called Beverly, and sometimes just Beverly's name would just come out as uh, uh, that was it. That was what you called it. <laughs> because he was on to the next thought, you know. But it's a great energy to have, and it's and uh, you know I'm teasing him, but it, it, it was he was very specific in his direction, very highly attuned to all the turns and twists and the immediate circumstances where we were in the story and contextualizing any moment. So, you know, you need that. You need that when you're telling a, an important story. You need a, a really strong director not just with energy, but with intelligence and, and wit. And we, we, we got him. So, um, you know, I knew from the first meeting it was going to be a, a, a riot to work with him, and it really was. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Doug Mara from Poland. And as a Polish journalist, I have to ask this question, because every time there is a film about Enigma, and in Poland there is a question, will they tell about our input? There isn't much of it in this film, because this is a character-driven story. But I was wondering, have you thought about putting more of Polish input into the Enigma solution? For the director and for the screenwriter, I, I'd like to ask both of you um, for the comment. There's, I can answer quickly. Uh, there's two references to it. I mean, we're, we're aware of the, the, the Polish achievement. Um, mm. and, and we wanted to acknowledge that by, by it's referenced twice uh, in, in the film. Um, I mean, it's 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 a long. We can talk about it for an hour, but you know that the, the how the Enigma was the Polish work was based on the um, the early version of the Enigma and how that Enigma was changed when when the war started and and the um, and the German army started to use it. Um, so so in many ways it was accurate that the work was a foundation, but in many ways it didn't help them actually so much because the Enigma was so fundamentally changed. So Alan. In many ways, he had to start over again. He had to start from scratch uh, with the work. So, so, but we wanted to acknowledge it, and we, I think we have done that in 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 the uh, in the film. You want to add? Graham, do you want to add to that? Oh yeah, no, I think everything Morton said is is absolutely right. And there's there's two references and two scenes. Um, Benedict's character makes references to the Polish contribution, um, and and certainly he had looked at the Polish bombs and used those as a model for the ones that, that Turing had created um, at Bletchley Park. So we wanted to sort of pay tribute to 
to the Polish work um, and show kind of what the, um, the mathematicians and scientists at Bleshley were able to build on top of that. Hi guys, um, first of all, congratulations on an absolutely beautiful piece of cinema. Um, my question's to Benedict. Um, Benedict, as someone who's made such an extraordinary success of playing a socially abrasive, heroic genius on our small screens in recent years, I'm curious, when you're approaching this role, did you feel a certain pressure to inject Alan with uh, nuances and, uh, and personality traits that distinguished him from Sherlock? And given the lack of source material available, where did you look for, for that uh, wonderful inspiration? Well, I mean, I'm limited by who I am and what I look like, but at the same time, they're utterly different people. So yes, of course, and I think I did. Um, you know, he doesn't swish around in a coat with curly hair, it, demonstrating how brilliant he is. He's a very quiet, stoic, determined, different and, uh, and definite hero. And I think someone who, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's smart, but I think the way that he has to operate as an outsider and as someone who is at all different is, is something that was very much out of the conditions of his life. And he, you know, as far as another similarity that he's socially awkward, what you see is a whole evolution in him, which is humanizing. And that happens, I suppose, in some aspects of, of, of what we do with uh, our version of Sherlock. But no, I didn't read the script and go, oh, this is Sherlock in tweed, uh, <laughs> fiddling around with uh, valves and wires, you know. Um, I, I, I like the wit of it. I liked how uncompromising he was. And I suppose that is, that is a strong trait, I think. But that's a strong trait in strong characters. And, and they always have a, an attraction for, for actors of, of, of every variety. So I, I yeah. Um, do you find I have played stupid people as well. I want to point that out. I mean, I'd, I'd, if anyone's got some more stupid roles out there for me, great, bring them on. But um, it's, um, you know, it's a great honour to be asked to play somebody like Alan Turing. So the last thing I'm going to do is go, well, yeah, but, you know, it's a bit like Sherlock, isn't it? Cause it's, and it's not. It's really not. And you can't begin to fathom, you know, what an individual is if you start just categorising them as having similarities to other characters you've played. And I, I do try and shake it up, but I do see why people... I think that two clever people um, might have similarities, but yeah. I'm Do you find those that. comparisons frustrating or understandable? Uh, no, I, I, no, I understand them. I mean, yeah, they're frustrating, but I do understand them. Of course I do. Of course I do. Um, I, I too watch stuff. Question <laughs> <laughs> service uh, for Kira, really. Uh, Turing's a very strange character in many ways. I suppose we'd now say autistic. Did you come to a conclusion as to what his character was? because he's in many ways very hard to read. I'm not saying in the film, but in real life. Um, I, I didn't think autistic. Um, I didn't get that from it. Um, I didn't get that from what you played. Were you playing autistic? No. No, I didn't think so. Um, <laughs> no, uh, did I get a read on, on what he was like from source Yeah, did, did you come to a conclusion as to what kind of man he'd been in real life? Um, no, I just thought he was what Benedict had gone for. <laughs> I mean, I, I know I, I thought it was a wonderful characterization. I thought it made complete sense. I'd read the, the same biographies that Benedict had read and, and, and obviously the same wonderful script, you know, and, and I thought it made a lot of sense. I mean, again, we don't actually know. You know, there aren't any recordings, as Ben's already said, so, so who knows. But I thought as a characterization it was, it was totally beautiful and really got the essence of what I felt I'd read from the source material. Graham, would you like to pick up on that autistic point there, or the suggestion that he was autistic, or that Bendy was playing him as autistic? Yeah, I mean, certainly that was a word that didn't exist during his lifetime, and I think in general, um, you know, diagnosing people 50 years after the fact gets gets a little bit dangerous. Um, it was something that was not a word that I think we ever used on set or in rehearsals. Um, certainly he's someone who had a sense of uh, sort of social outsiderness. He was not like the people around him, but I think that was because Alan Turing was separated from the world around him by so many different things. Because he was one of the great geniuses of the 20th century, because he was gay and closeted and couldn't tell anyone about it, because the government was asking him to keep all of these secrets, he was sort of the outsider's outsider. Um, and I think that's something we talked about in sort of bringing that to life in every scene. I just quickly, when I, there was a discussion we had a lot at it, and also with Benedict, and we didn't want to play anybody. We didn't want to put him in a box. I mean, the whole theme, the whole mission of the whole movie is to celebrate uniqueness, to celebrate individual, individual individuality, <laughs> and, and and to put sort of like a label on somebody is sort of like the opposite of what this movie is trying to do. And you know, it's then it becomes a condition, a disease, something curable, something that should be treated a specific way. He was just unique. It was just, you know, a character that thought 
in a different way. Uh, and and uh, that is what we wanted to celebrate, and that's what, what we wanted to tell. Thank you. There's a question down here, please. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Payden from Women Talking on my magazine, and my question is for Miss Knightley. And it's um, you talked at the start of the conference about how um, your character Joan Clark was sort of breaking boundaries for uh, for feminism. Would you say yourself that you believe there's a parallel between the era of the movie and now, what with this new wave of modern feminism? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, the actual Joan Clark, what she was fighting for was a place at the table in equal pay, and I think those are still the two main things that feminists today are fighting for and, and there's still inequality in that. So I definitely got that from, from the script and from researching her. I thought actually the similarities were quite extraordinary. Uh, the question is to Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, you spoke about how the assessment of uh, Alan Turing is changing, but why did it take so long until the 21st century for him to get that recognition? I don't know, but I guess the Official Secrets Act, I guess the dark stain of shame of the government's hand in persecuting thousands of men for their sexuality for fear of communist sympathies. I guess um, the idea that uh, somebody's work, which in the mathematical sphere, pure math, is, is devoid of, uh, for the larger part, geopolitical interests or any kind of culture of celebrity or uh, need for it, really, ab above and beyond funding and actually being able to function in that sphere. Um, means that, you know, the true amalgamated importance of the man is his life as well as his work. And that's only just slowly really become something that people have acknowledged. I, I, I yeah, why, why, couldn't, why the pardons couldn't have been earlier, I don't know. I'm not the Queen or David Cameron. Um, <laughs> maybe those will be my next roles. Um, I... <laughs> You'd like to see me play the queen. Yeah, I'll, You'd like to see me in that frock. I'll, I'll direct uh, the movie. I, uh, <laughs> oh, weird visions going through my head. Um, <laughs> yeah, so no, let's move on from that. Um, no, but seriously, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. And it, it, I, I'm, I'm not going to decry it as being a disgrace because I don't honestly know the circumstances. It would be very in, interesting to investigate that. Um, and I'd be interested if you did because, you know, to, to me, you know, you immediately feel a sense of injustice playing a man that was... Um, treated as appallingly as he was and um, whose achievements have for so long been overlooked or not conglomerated into the, the fuller picture of who he was and what he achieved that we're now getting to understand. And, you know, this is a film where we touch upon those and it's a thrilling story and it's funny and it's a film. But I, I beg anyone who's at all interested from what we present of him to, to look further into his life, his work at Bletchley Park, the biographies that have been written about him. Uh, and the other characters in the film, Joan and um, Hugh and, and Cairn Cross, you know, very fascinating characters, all who played an incredible part in um, being very quiet, stoic heroes, as well as, well as thousands of other men and women who uh, are nameless, um, who, some of whom are still alive and still keep their secrets, even though they don't have to anymore. Um, it's as much a celebration of that as well, but I think that might be part of it. Um, as a society, I think if we've lived through a very secretive era or a shaming era, we're very good at sort of looking over things, and it's dangerous, dangerous to do that, um, because the smell, you know, from underneath the floorboards eventually is impossible to ignore, and, um, you know, hopefully this will do something to expose the truth of what happened to the man, and some truth of the time as well. I just wondered, uh, Alan Leach isn't here today, who played John Kane Cross. Um, he is somewhere, though. Oh, is oh, he's he? He's in the hotel, yeah. Oh, right, okay. Where is he? Um, could, uh, could Kira and Bendig maybe talk a little bit about working with Alan? I don't know, was it the first time both of you worked with him? It's the first time I worked with him. He's wonderful. I uh, totally loved him. Uh, he was as bad at doing crosswords as I was. <laughs> and I appreciated that. I love Alan Leach. I, I, he's one of those people, you, after five minutes, you think you've known him all of your life. Yeah. And uh, he's, uh, he's just a lovely all-round human being, a brilliant, brilliant actor, really talented. And... Um, incredibly supportive and fun to be around and just yeah he, he, he makes for a very good uh, very good playing companion yeah to your thanks friend. who is the best out of the cast in applying the maths and uh, are you better at sudoku now you're much better you must be what was the last you part of the question be are you better at you sudoku be. now what's that are you better at sudoku now am i what better at better sudoku, at sudoku. I, I can't even hear so no. how can we go to sudoku um uh, no, no, <laughs> no. We we had we, we one day we all thought, oh yeah, we should really be doing crosswords. So we brought in like the quick quick crossword. There were five of us, and it took us five days, and we still didn't finish <laughs> it. 
So, no, we're really bad at all of it, and I didn't understand any of the maths. Did you? Don't say you did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that opens up a whole can of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember when we were there, we had this specialist who was trying to describe this wonderful machine, Alan Turing. Yeah. <laughs> was, yeah. Was and the, at Bletchley Park. Yeah, at Bletchley Park. Oh, and we my was, God. We were standing the, there the look on the guy's face is no, just you, how many brought, thousands of times. You brought him in. You we brought him, him in. We had all these experts, and they were trying, and we just... With listening, and then we see this panic in the awful. eyes of everybody. We're looking yeah. at each other, and it's like, this is this is impossible. It was it, that feeling that I haven't had since school, being in maths, of just like you sort of feel like you've died, <laughs> and there's no way to concentrate at all. And it was that, and I'm desperately fighting because he was such a nice man. You go, this is really interesting. I should be paying attention, and I couldn't. I mean, you know, there's a great broad romance to the philosophy of maths and, and physics, which is dramatised these days, which is which is tangible, hopefully, because otherwise yeah. there's no point in explaining it or sharing it with an audience. And I think there are hugely exciting things that, on a base level, everyone can understand. The idea of coding, the idea of programming, the idea that what we use as language can be turned into something universal and could be used in a machine here, China, Russia, mm. you know, New York, wherever. And... And th 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 those things excite me. You know, the fact that my eyelash has carbon in it from a star excites me. I don't necessarily understand everything about how to make an eyelash, but it's <laughs> the broad brushstrokes are very appealing. And I, you know, as far as the machine goes, the machine, the bomb, Christopher and ours, but the bomb, in reality, at Bletchley Park, that was the moment where I thought, right, no, this, I, I'm... This is very hard. And, and, and the, guy, the guy standing in front said, can you explain it to me? And he just looked at me and went, Right, so <laughs> what we have here, and you, was, you knew it was not just me, not just a stupid actor, but also the fact that every other person isn't necessarily a pure math expert, a mechanical engineer, or a combination of the two. Um, these are incredibly complex machines, breaking down incredibly complex problems at great high level and, 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 and uh, sorry, high pace and high volume. And you know, I, underst I understood a little bit about it. I did understand a little bit. I understood a lot about the Enigma machine, the actual coding machine. Mm. And, but yeah, if you put an algorithm in front of me now, I, uh, even a quadratic equation would have this press conference go on far too long than it should do. <laughs> We've got time. Benjamin from Gay Times. Um, this is to Benedict. I was wondering how you approached portraying Alan's sexuality and its subtleties and doing it in a way that was appropriate to that generation. Um, his sexuality is something that is contained, that is, that is expressed in the film, but not shown explicitly, neither is there heterosexuality expressed in the film. Um, and so what we show of it, what his, his behavior towards his sexuality is, is sadly true to the story, which is that he had to, for a large part, suppress it, make it private, make it something secret. And when th the cost of sharing that information, but also, in Alan's case, being completely explicit with it, whether it's talking about you know treating a young man to touch my penis in the in the police interrogation scene, whether it's talking with um, uh, oh my mind's gone blank, um, Anna Leach's Cairn uh, Cross, thank you. Uh, we're talking about Cairn Cross confessing his sexuality at the engagement party is just to honour Alan, uh, one of complete honesty, of guilelessness, of innocence, and 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 sort of t to be aware of the risks, but at the same time. Um, not willing to cave in to uh, the intolerance or, or the, the, the potential permutations of, of confessing such a thing. And I think, I think that's possibly where he stands. I know lots of people um, own him as a martyr or someone who is um, a standard bearer for a cause. Um, I think he was just very true to himself, which I think is a form of martyrdom. It is. Um, but he didn't make a political statement out of it. It was, it was a personal thing for him. Um, and to remember that he was physically active, so his sexuality was something that was important, that his physicality was important, his, his athleticism as well as a runner was important. Um, and while it turned out to be the most important tragic strand of his story, it is but one strand of, of his character, albeit an incredibly important one. So, um, yeah, it was really important to me. It was really important to me that we, that we got that element of it right. And I think in that time, the conversations you hear are incredibly explicit. Um, yeah, does that sort of answer the question? Sorry. <laughs>
going on there? We're going to have to wrap up the press conference now. I just want to end by, Morton, you spoke earlier about how excited you were to open the London Film Festival with the imitation game. Kira and Benedict, you're both, sorry to exclude you, Graham, but you're, you're both Londoners. Yeah. You, I, know, I know both of you have attended the film festival before. What does it mean to both of you to open this festival with this film? Go. OK. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. It's really amazing. I mean, yeah, yes. I'm a Londoner, and I've always wanted to spend more time at the LFF and to be, you know, to be up front and centre with this film. I couldn't be more proud of it and all of, all of our work in it. And to, to present that to Londoners is just terrific. And, um, yeah, I'm really, really excited. It means a lot. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, good luck with the release. Good luck with tonight. And uh, thank you very much, all four of you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you.